Okay, it starts by you saying in front of your children and to your children that they are somehow better than other people just because they eat different food. The next time, it is okay to kill the person next door. Very few words in Kenya provoke denial, anger, confusion, and psychopathy like tribalism. <laughs> tribalism is the state of being organized by or advocating for tribes or tribal lifestyles. Thieves in this country are not referred to by their names. They are referred to by their tribe. In a political context, tribalism can also mean discriminatory behavior now at my age, if I say like, oh, like, why do you like really got on my nerves because, mm. ah, what did you expect? Attitudes based on loyalty to one's social group. Ideally, if you, if you take a different position, then you're assumed to be a traitor to that particular community. In practice, it involves the unification of one tribe by demonizing another tribe to the point of dehumanizing its members. Dehumanization is at the center of every genocide in recorded history. We are hardwired neurobiologically to not be able to kill, rape, torture, beat each other. So in order to be able to do that, we have to slowly move groups of people out of what we consider moral inclusion. We have to move them out of what we see as humanity. In colonial times, it was the source of strength and inspiration for Africans to fight for their independence. In Kenya, the us versus them agenda was perpetrated by local leaders in their quest to unify the Africans. And it's not tribalism. In fact, the common myth is that Mau Mau was about the Kikuyu community. It wasn't. The struggle for justice started with nationalists that you find across the entire breadth, with Mekatelilis, with, with uh, Samuei, Kuitaleo, and then they metamorphosized into a Mau Mau struggle. Creating the division of identity enabled them to express the unfairness and inequality between white settlers and Africans, whom they believed the owners of the land in which they were being oppressed. This is when Kenya birthed phrases that we hear up to date during tribal clashes like Go back to your land, my people, and our ancestors' land, among others. Brothers, I think I have spoken enough in this language. It is not my wish that I should be speaking to you in a foreign and for that matter in colonialistic language. Yaremogi insisted that Kenyatta is our leader and Kenyatta is, is our God. The difference between then and now is that it has metamorphosed into ethnicity rather than nationalism. Jomo Kenyatta is the father of the African nationalism and the African national movement in this country. But surely you're all rather more advanced than he is in your thinking about politics. Wouldn't he embarrass you if he was really let go now? We cannot be, we cannot in any sense be more advanced than our teacher and master, whom I think is much more advanced in political outlook in this country than we are. We was a vision that the nationalists who fought for independence had was betrayed in 1968. It's a vision that was again betrayed in 02. Welcome to Kujiangalia, and in this video, we will take a deeper look at the underlying injustices we call tribalism, its necessity in Kenyan politics, how and most importantly, why it's evolving into class war. <laughs> Today, although publicly frowned upon, it's still the primary tool for political mobilization. Discriminatory behavior or attitudes based on loyalty to ethnic groups are still prevalent. Worst of all, the victims of the violence that it usually manifests into are afflicted by homelessness, poverty, 
and trauma that is often ignored by the public and government. Tukapigwa, watoto wawiri wangu wakauliwa, na kutoka hapo shida ikaanza. Tulieda kuishi police station. Kwa anza na operation rudisha silaha. Tukisha wanyaganya silaha, mtuambia turudi nyumbani. Lakini walikuwa na tulazimisha turudi nyumbani. Kama anza natoseka paka lini? Kama ni raila, wameka vizuri na kibaki wanisa liniana muna tuona sisi kinateseka. Na watoto jamani. Nabeba miziko kama njisi yetu. Uhuru gani tuko na yapa na Kenya tafugani. It's about justice. And you cannot have prelates as long as this country does not acknowledge that something very wrong happened in 2007, that something very sick happened in 1997, that something very sick happened in 1992, that something very sick has been happening in this country for decades. Now that more and more Kenyans are speaking out against tribalism and encouraging unity and nationalism, it is important to note that we have been here before, more than once. In fact, the late Kenyan historian E.S. Atieno Otiambo describes this as the ideology of order. Kenya's leaders, he argued, have consistently held up order and stability as necessary for economic growth and development. That fetishization of order has been used to discredit those who dissent from the state's development policies and to allow the state to violate its citizens' human rights. The argument remains important and relevant. The president cautioned leaders against divisive politics, saying it was dragging the country's development agenda. Viongozi badala ya kushirikiana, kuheshimiana, kufanya kazi pamoja, wakijua ya kwamba jukumu lao ni kubadilisha maisha ya wananchi ambao ndio wengi. Yetu imekuwa kila saa Nisiasa ya vita, nisiasa ya maneno, nisiasa ya mwana. Kenya Between Hope and Despair, a book authored by historian Daniel Branch, acknowledges that while tribalism assumes many faces in Kenya, it is merely a symptom of the broken promises of redistribution and the weaponization of recognition by Kenya's plutocrats. There are politics of exclusion, which actually enhance ethnicity. By redistribution and recognition, he is referencing the works of Nancy Fraser, an American theorist and philosopher. Fraser argues that in a post-Cold War world, debates about redistribution have been replaced by identity politics. In her words, group identity supplants class interests as the chief medium of political mobilization. Moreover, the demand for recognition of the grievances of an identity group such as an ethnic community displaces socio-economic redistribution as the remedy for injustice and the goal of political struggle. That what we have is a, is a tribe of two people, the rich and the poor. So if we don't look at the issues of the two classes and see how to bridge the gap, then that's where the problem will be and continue to be. Redistribution politics was about the reallocation of the country's land as the freedom fighters believed that the white settlers would be kicked out. Considering they owned about 76% of the land, yet their population literally made up 1% of the country's population, their departure excited their African slaves. The problem with redistribution was that the inequality favored the white settlers they owned majority of the land and were determined to keep it that way. This sentiment was shared by the British government as seen in the letters of their last Governor General, Malcolm MacDonald. In a letter to Arthur Bottomley, the Secretary of State to Commonwealth Relations, MacDonald wrote that Kenyatta was the best hope for the protection of Britain's interests, even after independence. Mr. Kenyatta, some of the 60,000 European settlers here are frightened that their titles to land and their right to stay in Kenya may be thrown overboard when a Kenyan administration takes over. Well, and I don't think they have anything to fear, pro providing that they behave as a good citizen. The last governor thought it critical that Kikuyu supporters of Kanu should hold the upper hand after independence, as their protests against British rule culminated in the Mau Mau Rebellion. MacDonald believed that this tradition of protest meant that the Kikuyus would not accept marginalization after independence and would take their revenge if they were alienated by British interests, such as the European settler farms. The famous colonialist tactic of divide and conquer was evidently still at play even after independence. 
The new Kanu government would go on to ignore the average citizen who at the time was uneducated and relied on wages for working in the settler farms. It even ignored the workers whose white settlers wouldn't pay them their dues. And, with assistance from Britain and United States, slowly pushed out the leaders that championed redistribution, like Oginga Odinga, Bildad Gagia, Acheng Oneko, and in other cases even murdered them, like in the case of Pio Gama Pinto, Tom Boya, and JM Karaoke. Mboya's assassination immediately poisoned ethnic relations between the Luo tribe and President Kenyatta's Kikuyu community. Resentment among the Luos ended in street battles with the police as frustration mounted over the killing of one of Kenya's most gifted political leaders. And it was only a matter of time before the assassination rattled one of Kenya's most stabilizing political friendships, that of Jomo Kenyatta and Jaramogi Oginga Odinga. Three months after the assassination of Tom Boya, a visit to Kisumu by President Kenyatta ended in violence, death, and an ugly verbal exchange between Kenyatta and Oginga. There was no way of stopping Tom from ever becoming the president of this country. And the only way to stop him, instead of thanking him, they gave him three bullets in his chest at lunchtime. Kenyans never got the independence they sought. Mzee vowed to protect land titles and in a few years silenced redistribution. In other words, nothing changed except for Mzee's new favorite hobby of land grabbing. I had no doubt in my mind that what we had was a dictatorship and it is not what Uhuru was meant to be. You see, we ignored the people who lived in the forests and the mountains. Okay. We began to behave and act as if it's not they who fought in the mountains and sacrificed. We began to talk as if it is the educated uh, nationalist who somehow rather magically brought about you know, independence. When criticism for Mau Mau compensation got too loud to ignore, he organized the Kikuyu communities into groups that his government would buy land for in areas like Rift Valley and settle them there. The rest of the tribes of Kenya watched as the country's revenue went into developing Kiambu. Looking at that, he told members of parliament from different tribes that my tribe drinks the milk of the afternoon and your tribe drinks the milk of the afternoon. Which, you know, obviously like denotes that like like we get first dibs on like national resources. And from 60s we're going forward, including our economic planning, including how we divide and share resources and everything else, has just been a process that discriminates, that dispossesses, and then that, that, that gives advantage to some of our others. With no money, land, or education, the rest of the country was still condemned to die in the overcrowded informal settlements that were allocated to them by the British, except for the people of the Somali tribe. My parents who were born within the territorial boundaries of the East African British Protectorate, what later became Kenya. But when my turn to get an identity card came, it took me a lifetime to obtain the one piece of document that without it would have otherwise meant I could be deported to Somalia. Before the declaration of Kenya as a republic, the Northern People's Progressive Party, the NPPP, which represented the people of the region, won a referendum that would make Northeastern Province part of Somalia. 
As a people, they had been marginalized by the colonialists and felt indifferent to the Kanu government. Besides, in the words of Abdi Rashid Ali Shemark, the then Somali Prime Minister, we speak the same language, we share the same creed, the same culture and the same traditions. How can we regard our brothers as foreigners? However, Kanu, just like the government before them, held on to the northeastern province in the hopes of finding oil in the region. The NPPP demanded immediate secession from what they described as a new form of imperialism. Instead of the referendum getting implemented, the shifter wars began. The wars lasted for four years, and over 2,000 people suspected of being part of the rebellion were killed. Kenyatta was not a single person, but he had that personality. Borrowing the tactics that led to the fall of the Mau Mau from their colonial masters, Mzee's administration forced the survivors into newly constructed villages built around police posts. All the areas where shifter units were active were declared prohibited, and communal fines were imposed on entire villages if shifter activities were suspected. To top it all off, their local administration was appointed based on their experience in the anti Mau Mau campaign. Their provincial commissioner, John Buru, whose wives are still in court fighting over his grabbed land, told the locals to pack up and go to Somalia if they could. Those who are interested in building Kenya to be a civilized one are welcome to stay. Although by Mzee's death, only two high schools had been built in the region and up to date, some residents have to walk for miles to get to schools that are not only in different towns, but they also can't afford. With over 500 people in this village, many of them are telling us they've not even had the privilege of ever voting in this country. They are asking if the government will come to their aid and give them identity cards. Infrastructure here is also wanting. For example, if one of them fell ill, they would have to travel for over 60 kilometers to seek decent medical attention. It's not about people not liking you. It's about that the person that doesn't like you has the power to do something to you. It wasn't all rainbows and roses for the Kikuyu people though. 1963 was a very dark year for all immigrant residents in most districts. As the Kikuyu had integrated the best into the British way of life of moving around in search of work, they were the most affected. We look Kikuyu, you know what I mean? So it's just kind of like feeling like when we're just like this target. So, and it's like the first time, it's like if someone asked my dad like, oh, you know, where are you from? It was like, oh, you know, we are, we are in, we are big. <laughs> and I was like, like, I feel like I never really thought about what it meant to be Kikuyu at a national level, at a political level, until that time. And Twelve months before Kenya became a republic, Kanu and Kadu had to share power under the Kenya Independence Act of the United Kingdom with Mze as the Prime Minister. The independence constitution featured Majimboism, which basically meant that the national resources would be split at a national level but distributed through the county governments. Mze was determined to have the constitution amended to ensure that the national government had all the power. Our problems did not begin in 2007. That was just a climax. We have been having all these problems uh, since before independence. And after independence 63, things continue being the same. Kadu leaders caught on to this and decided to exploit their power before parliament was able to pass the amendment. Despite making up three quarters of the population, Kikuyu residents of Timau were kicked out while their houses were burnt down as instructed by local officials. The Sabatia settlement scheme ordered the eviction of non Tugans at Kilombe on the day after independence. Luos based in Nairobi warned Kenyatta that, quote, there will be another Congo should land in eastern Nyanza be granted to non Luos. Luya leaders denounced the quote uncivilized tribes of Kalenjis and warned of a coming civil war around the country. The upsurge of ethnicity 
triggered in response to decolonization and intensified by the debates of Majimboism, turned violent in the months leading up to and following independence. To combat the growing violence, Mze responded by starving the regional assemblies of the funds they needed to operate. By July 1964, the bank accounts of the regional assemblies were empty. Finally, in late November 1964, Kadu agreed to merge with Kanu ahead of the implementation of the constitutional amendments that made Kenya a republic, Kenyatta a president, and the country a highly centralized one-party state. This, however, did nothing for all the displaced people or the largely poverty-stricken citizens. First centralization of power into one institution, the presidency. This is what actually created the patronage system because the institution of the presidency became too powerful. It emasculated all other institutions of government. And now the patronage system created by the elite from the president's community started. I know every time I go to the villages, as I'm encroaching the village, the rules get a little, you know, sad. I was like riding the whole time. I'm asleep in the car. I'm like, I'm like, why is this rice so smooth? Like, are we going to somebody's village for a funeral? Like, why is this, why are these roasts so good for like three hours straight? And I'm like, uh-uh. You know this is Raila's hometown now. The road to Raila's hometown and everyone who's around there for about four hours, like proximity, benefits because that is Raila's hometown. There's this taxi guy who's taking me back home. I live in Parkland, it's the Parkland area. <laughs> and it's like the Indian kind of area. Uh, area. And he was like, ah, he was like, you, see, the people, you can tell the people in this area don't vote. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, why? And he's like, look at the roads. Through 1969 and early into 1970, Kikuyu, Embu, Meru, and Kamba were taken in their thousands to Kenyatta's home. One recent estimate suggests that over 300,000 people were transported to Gatundu. According to one account, this is the Utamaki Oath that they all had to take. The government of Kenya is under Kikuyu leadership and this must be maintained. If any tribe tries to set itself up against the Kikuyu, we must fight them in the same way that we died fighting the British settlers. No uncircumcised leaders will be allowed to compete with the Kikuyu. You shall not vote for any party not led by the Kikuyu. Luckily, Moi was circumcised. Kenyatta's death was our way out of, <laughs> into freedom, out of prison, into freedom. And you can't imagine how happy we felt when we got the news. Take a moment to picture where Kenya would be had redistribution policies actually been implemented. For one, the idea of inequality would be a mystery to us. Maybe even poverty would not be part of our discourse. Maybe, just maybe, Kenya would be a first world country rather than having a few filthy rich families. This is the same country where children are dying of starvation in Turkana, yet we lead Africa in the number of billionaires. With the rise of socialist politicians like Bernie Sanders, AOC, even Ilhan Omar, who, by the way, was a refugee in our country, maybe it is safe for Kenyan politicians to be openly socialist. The independence of African countries came about at the height of the Cold War. This led to our socialist politicians being demonized by the global empire. Some were even assassinated for being communists. This is the main reason why the ideology has died out. It is no secret that Kenyan politics has not been about ideologies for decades. But this is the time to demand for policies that work for Africa. Despite claiming that neoliberalism would foster hard work and competition, Jomo Kenyatta, his family, and other politicians, majority of politicians in this country do not abide by the same values. They grab land, they steal our resources, they hoard them, and all of this is under the guise of capitalism. Focusing on identity politics, to the level of how penises look is a blatant attempt at erasing the real issues from public consciousness. Think about it. Even the recent Hustler versus Dynasty narrative 
is an evolution of the very same identity politics because the tribalism approach is getting old. Thank you all for tuning in. When we started the research, we did not expect the video to be this long. So thank you for staying to the very end. A very special thank you to our friends Rash for letting us use their song, Nita Change. All the links will be in the description below. This has been Kuji Angalia. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Ring the notification bell, and you will be notified when we release part two. We can't wait to hear your thoughts in the comment section. We'll see you there.